And I'm going to hand over to Aaron now, who is hosting. Here you are. Aaron is going to be I was just commenting how this looks like a space where you'd bring a kidnapped politician for the rest of the day. Imagine some Turkish Stalinists with that Erdogan student from Stalinism. Right, so, uh, so we... Everybody... It does look like that, doesn't it? Good. So I'll start from my left, uh, we've got Max Shanley. Uh, Max, I believe you work with Jacobin, don't you? You collaborate with Jacobin? Uh, noted author of an article saying how all of the Blairites would be deselected, and that was about two months before Jeremy actually won the first time. Uh, so he's a very prescient intellect when it comes to the future of the Labour Party. Uh, to Max's right, I have Selena Top. who is a professor of modern history at Oxford and a local Labour member, and your area of specialisation is history from below, you were saying? Yeah, I wrote a book called People. I wrote a book called People about the history of the working class that Jeremy Corbyn has got two copies of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Available in all good bookshops, especially independent ones. And I'm president of the Socialist Education Association. Yeah. Big shout out to our member Steve London, who's here. We're yeah. the great Manchester branch. Please join. And then to my right, I have Lauren Stocks. Lauren is a... Come on. Yeah. Lauren is a paint, science based name and activist. Um, you just finished your GCSEs? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Bloody hell, go Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, I'm nowhere near as, as impressive as I actually are Max, but yes, I, did, I, did, I did go and slag off my uh, GCSEs for uh, two minutes on a... Uh, Life and then finally we have Paul Mason. Paul was at the BBC, I believe, 13 years. He was at the BBC 13 years. He made it worth watching, nobody else does. Um, and he's, of course, the noted author of Post Capitalism. Uh, and another Labour Party member, so we've got a full house, right? All Labour Party members, very good. Um, so today's Today's conversation is about labour and power and of course because we're coming out of a period of two years of desolation, graft, taking on the establishment and winning, big hand to everybody here for that, and winning, right, 72% 72% of the delegates at conference were on the left, not the Mickey Mouse left, the left, um, and that's really important. And now of course we're being told that we're being you know, hubristic, hyperbolic, euphoric, just for saying, well, we've achieved something really momentous, which we have. So the question which we'll be talking about today, about labour in power, is it done from a position of hubris or hyperbole, necessity, okay? Because it's clear that a, a Labour Party led by Jeremy Corbyn, even with a programme of the kind we saw in the manifesto of the last general election, would face momentous challenges. And each of today's uh, speakers will touch upon uh, one or two or several of them. I'll start with Paul Mason. I think, Paul, you can give a brief overview of the kind of institutional, political and economic challenges that a, a Corbyn government might face uh, in the opening several months or years. So maybe you want to touch on that? Yeah, okay. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Can you, can you all hear me? Um, so, I mean, the first thing to say is brilliant that this space uh, exists. I know the people who've been organising it and it's brilliant to see it in its actuality. And I think to also say to you that despite, you know, there's all sorts of people, young people, people new to politics, I'm also seeing around the room, you know, people who spent their life on the shop floor at Halewood, people who, who started out in politics in Derry in 1968. I, friends, people I've known for years, we have an incredible, what, it, what you might call, capital, for use of one super better word, of political experience in this room. And I hope in the time available, we can all share it and learn something from each other. Now, Theresa May has taken to, de to defending capitalism. And if she made a speech this week where she's claimed that capitalism is, let me read it out, <laughs> the greatest um, driver of human progress ever created, um, Driving us out of darkness into the light of modernity. 
Right, there's only two word answer to that. <laughs> Ducey Bridge. Ducey Bridge is just around the corner. Yeah? The Ducey Bridge pub is, a, is closed permanently, as it says on Google. And the bridge itself, you can walk across it as you leave here. In 1842, a bloke called Frederick Engels wrote a book about the working class in Manchester. And not to, I mean, I don't want to read out the whole passage uh, that he writes about Ducey Bridge, but the short summary is, Ducey Bridge is a shithole. <laughs> it's full of slums, it's full of uh, people forced into a life of crime, people who can't support themselves, people who are hungry, the buildings are destitute, they're falling apart, they're grimy, they're shit in the river. Walk across the bridge. 100, and what is it? 60, 70, 80, 170 years of this great capitalist system, you know, the great driver of progress and modernity. Later, Alan Turing invents the computer here. The hydraulic system, you know, uh, modernizes Manchester here. It's the workshop of the world here in Manchester. But round the corner, you've got buildings that are unused. You've got buildings that are uninhabitable. You've got down here, the greatest centre of, you know, sort of, Sodom and Gomorrah organised crime in Britain. That's, what cap that's what's wrong with capitalism. For all the fact that it revolutionises production, for all splitting the atom and inventing the computer, it is not dragging people out of an, an essentially relative position of being poor, being oppressed, being forced to live a life of ignorance and day-to-day anti-mirth existence. It's, that's the problem with it. So, look, we, in the labour movement, are doing something about it. We're doing something about it at last. And this is what the entire week of the Tory party conference will be lived in the shadow of. Because for the first time, not in like 10 years, because I remarked that you know, the, night, the, the conference in Brighton that's just ended did feel to me a lot like, a lot like the Brighton Labour Party conference of 1980. Um, so that's 30 odd years ago. But it's not even then. But I saw Tony Ben stand up at the, Bright, at, the Bright, at the Blackpool Labour Party conference of 1980 and do this speech, nationalisation, abolish the House of Lords. It was brilliant. We all clapped. And people like me on the far left said, right, that's it, I'm in, I'm joining Labour. Problem was, Ben didn't win. He got a derisory uh, vote when he stood to be leader. The unions didn't even back any of the proposals he, he proposed at that conference. That's how historic what we have achieved is. We've achieved way more already than Benism. But what do we need to do to make it count? I think one thing we need to do is to just narrow down what a Labour government means so that it's not about just explaining it to your mum or to your apolitical brother or sister, but literally being able to explain it out here to the minicab drivers, to the security guards, to people who live in a precarious economy. You know, when you ask them, you say join a union, anybody done this, to somebody who's like fairly young, under 22, sometimes they say, what is a union? Yeah. Yeah? So we have a massive task, but you know, to winnow it down and to simplify it, I would do it like this. You have trouble finding somewhere to live, we're going to build a million houses. Some of them will be for rent, some of them will be to buy, some of them will be council houses. So there will be no more Grenfell. That's the first thing. The second thing is, some things in society everybody should have. This is the fundamental difference between us and the neoliberals. You know, when you hear Blairites, when you hear right-wing Labour MPs say, ah, oh, but giving students free education privileges the privileged, that's an argument that's in Milton Friedman's book, 1962, against welfareism. It is the fundamental argument of the right that if you give everybody something, it privileges rich people. Well, we say that's worth it. Because what it then does is it gives everybody, including that rich person who gets sent to university for zero, zip, diddly squat fees, a stake in the society we ought to build. So we want basic things to be free for everybody. Healthcare, education at school, education at university, transport as far as possible, you know, and the benefits and disability benefits that you need if you're just incapable and can't work or can't find a job. The third thing I think we need to say to, to, to people outside, what we're going to do, we're going to switch off the privatisation machine. That costs nothing. There doesn't need to be any kind of monetary, large or small, magical or realistic, uh, to do it. 
You just switch off the machine that relentlessly hands public goods into, into private sector. Why is that important? It's not just about, say, water. So they say, okay, well, business is terrified of labor. We're going to renationalize water. Why, 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 why is that a problem? Okay. Well, the argument is by nationalizing it, you made, by privatizing it, they made it better, more efficient. Okay? There's a steady stream of profit set, set by the state. The state decides how much profit shareholders get if they own water shares. The state decides what standards the Northwest Water Authority, or whatever it's now called, Norway, delivers to you. Uh, the state gave them the asset, the state regulates the asset. The argument is, only by being in private hands can you drive innovation. Well, the problem is, one of the water companies, Welsh Water, is a non-profit owned by its own workers, and it's the most innovative one. See, the argument doesn't stack up. So in water, it's a no-brainer, but it's really important to switch off the machine that is constantly handing, constantly driving private sector forces into the public <coughs> sector for this reason. The share price of Google, Amazon, Facebook is all based on the assumption that one day they will own the NHS. That's what, that, look, the share prices are way in excess of the profits they make. It can only be based on the idea that everything's privatized. So once we switch it off, we switch off a signal to the rest of capitalism. Fourthly, I think what we need to do is to understand that there will be a backlash when we do these things. Even these basic, simple things, no more Grenfells, no more social cleansing of their estates, no more uh, privatizing the NHS, there'll be a backlash. Now the nature of that backlash is different than the one I think that, that people like me saw, and people who were slightly older than me saw in the 1970s and 80s, uh, as summed up in Chris Mullins book, A Very British Coup. The, the state in modern capitalism is far more uh, controlled by law because you've got all these private companies running prisons, running water companies, etc. There has to be more of a legal basis than there was when like, MI5 went across um, London, as it was said, bugging and burgling the uh, Wilson Labour government, which they did. So I'm not so bothered, I'm a bit bothered, but I'm not so bothered about like, what you might call the secret state. I am very concerned about what the markets will do. And this is why me and John McDonnell and others at that Brighton conference talked in detail about it, because we want to get it out there. <coughs> we think that Labour has a big offer to the financial se sector, and the, the first part of that is we're going to stabilise the Brexit process. We'll make very clear what is going to be the outcome, and it will be the softest possible form of it, if we can achieve it. The second thing is, we're going to borrow 250 billion pounds and spend it on infrastructure, spend it on, on raising, the, raising everything, roads, buildings, schools. Pension funds, long-term money like that, they like the idea of government borrowing, spending long-term, and a kind of steady but low payback, because that's what pensioners live on. There is none of that because of quantitative easing, because of all the money that's been printed. Interest rates on long-term investment are close to zero. We can create a big, a big incentive for the long-term money in the City of London and the world financial system. What we can't do is, is uh, I think, assuage the short-term money, the hedge funds, the people who are in it for a fast buck, the 24-7 uh, uh, <coughs> currency markets. And we must accept, I expect, that as the Labour government comes to power threatening this fundamental change in favour of working people and ordinary people, they're probably going to try and stuff us up, to put it in a polite way. Um, so we need to do things. One thing we need to do is reassure them and persuade many people, including even people who vote Tory now, that it would be better if capitalism were run our way. More humane, more stable, more dynamic, you know, more you know, just even the kind of Nordic models, what, what Sweden is like, applied to Britain it seems revolutionary because we're just so unwilling to do it. That's what was the, the beauty of when Labour proposed the beginnings of a national childcare system. It was only the beginnings in the manifesto. It's not like full Swedish model, but it's there. The beginnings of the idea that you have cheap childcare that everybody can afford. See, we, can, we need to persuade a lot of people to do this. But that, that brings me to the final thing. If I have one worry about this movement, which it, it, let, let's talk about the upsides of it. The upsides are, say, the, the British left, the far left, when I was in it in the 80s, was pre forget all the, the nominal membership figures. There was probably 5,000... 6,000 activists. You know, militant just about filled the Albert Hall. Uh, SWP had you know, a good number of people, but that was it. 
Momentum's got at least, what is it, 23,000? 30,000 members and 100,000 on a mailing list. Because they're not the SWP. It's not a disciplined organization. I don't want it to be that kind of organization. But it's a big organization and it has a massive social footprint already. <laughs> That's the upside. What's the downside is, and I think some of my colleagues from the, you know, from the, from the, the era of the shop students movement and the era of free dairy and all the rest of it would agree. You've got a very attenuated, a very shrunken tradition of movement from below. That's why Corbynism is attractive, because people feel so powerless that they think it's going to be started up here. It's going to be one guy, it's going to be a few people, it's going to be a Labour government, and then it delivers. Because if you look at, say, if you're in that, look at those blogs by those Grenfell people. They're blogging every day. It's going up in flames, it's going up in flames, guys. But nobody listens to them, because no, Labour councillors are not really on the case, to be honest, in that borough. What they're expecting is somebody to solve it from above because they're so powerless themselves. I think our biggest danger is that we go into this period of putting the Labour government in power without understanding the need, the need for these 30,000 people and the 100,000 people around them and anybody outside on listen to do one thing. When, it, when we go to power, we want to be quite kind to the bourgeoisie because there'll be a shock to them. You know, there'll be a big shock. So let's not do anything hasty. But if they come for us, We've all got to do the same thing at once, spontaneously. And that thing isn't a revolution. It's just, it's just exerting the power from below of ordinary network people, working people, students, young people, to say, no, you are not going to sabotage a democratically elected government. I, as you know, reported what happened in Greece. Uh, I reported what happened as well in the Scottish referendum. There was an element of this in the Scottish referendum. All kinds of lies printed by the Treasury and the Bank of England about how terrible it would be. The bosses threat Ironbrook, we're leaving Scotland. All of that, it will happen to us. But we've got to, in a measured way, without panicking, work out ways of uh, how people emerge from a building like this and do things lawfully, peacefully, in a way that says to you know, the, the international financial system, you cannot do this to us. And it was the absence of being able to do that that, that made Syriza lose. And I'm determined that we will not lose. Thank you. Everybody will speak, then I'll ask maybe one question to each person, or maybe the whole panel, then we'll go to questions. Uh, the next speaker is Lauren. Uh, Lauren is going to talk about uh, the relationship between Labour and Power and the young vote. There is always the possibility of new energised younger voters being the first to feel disappointment. So how can Labour and Power warn against that kind of disappointment and stop Jeremy Corbyn becoming Nick Clegg 2.0? Uh, you, you've given me an, an extremely well. I, I don't say I don't, shouldn't say difficult question to answer. I'll, I'll count but that, I'll count no, no, no. Because we're going to have to compromise inevitably. Yeah. On, on something. Yeah, but like Nick Clegg, that's um, that's slightly offensive. No. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm, I, for the most part, I'm just going to kind of split my speech into two parts. So first one is going to be kind of like how we can keep. Um, the youth vote by what we end up doing in the next election and the one up to that next election when it comes to young people. So, that, uh, And then the second bit is obviously uh, how we can appeal to younger voters and slowly change their perceptions on you know, whether or not we actually give a toss about them because um, at the moment I don't think it feels like the establishment does give a shit about young people and if we are to become the establishment in the near future or very close future, as I would hope, um, it's vital that we uh, reinstate that. And I was like, all right, just talking about sort of the youth vote. Anyway, um, so, but, so to keep people involved, you've kind of got, I've made no, I've, again, I've made no notes here, just, just go easy on me. Um, so we've got like this uh, kind of, one in three people saw a Momentum video on Facebook or Twitter. Now, if you look at the results of the 2016, 2017 election, sorry, you've got, um, I think it was 60% turnout, 64% turnout to the 18 to 24 year old votes. Now 60% of those people voted for the Labour Party and there has to be a correlation between our social media use and the turnout that we managed to instate in the election. Now we've somehow managed 
through honest politics and through um, not like and just coming across as authentic, we've somehow managed to create this trust and a relationship between an octogenarian and the millennials. Now you would never ever think that those two would be a happy marriage, but somehow they have been. And we've now got um, so we've got like. I'm so tired. I'm so, <laughs> um, so we've got like this kind of. Um, we've basically just got to keep going. We can't let the. We can't keep. Um, we, we can't let the youth vote die. In in the sense that we keep. Um, we keep people in the dark. Um, I I find like if, <laughs> I, story time right. So after do you know you, you've all you know prom night right. So after prom it was a house party. Um, now. Picture it, so we've got 40 to 50, 15 to 16 year olds who have come out of prom, and they come in and they sit down, um, and I came in late, and um, the guy who hosted the, the party was kind of like, crap, we never thought you'd make it, and somebody came up to me, there's three of them, and they were like, listen, we've just joined our la we've just joined the Labour Party, when's our uh, next local Labour Party meeting? And I'm thinking, fan fucking tastic indoctrination time, right? So, and, and literally, at two in the morning, we've got like, a chance of teenagers going, oh, Jeremy Cole. I've never seen anything like it, right? And these people, in the next two years, or whenever, whenever a general election may be, in 2018 or 2019 or 2020, these people are going to become old enough to vote. And your concentration needs to be on the people that are currently sat in college, thinking about how the hell they're going to afford their tuition fees, and how the hell they're going to afford to eat, and how the hell they're going to afford their bus passes. I paid £240 for my bus pass. I only live about six miles away from my college, and yet my parents have been fleeced of about a quarter of a grand. That's insane. We need to improve public infrastructure, we need to improve the education system, but it's how we manage to do that, it's how quickly we can get it done. Paul made an incredible point by saying we're going to have to be very, very careful and kind to the bourgeoisie in, um, in raising taxes, and I do agree with that, but we also have to, there's a treading, there's a line we have to tread, which is how quickly can we implement reforms that remove um, ridiculous train fares, and remove tuition fees, and remove, you know, in reinstate the housing benefits for 18 to 24 year olds. So, you know, um, an overwhelming population of the homeless don't belong to the male 18 to 24 demographic, because quite frankly, that's atrocious. Um, you know, it's, it's things like that. We just need to keep going. And one of the things is that needs doing, um, promise to tell people how it's gonna be done. It's a little bit like, do you know when you order a pizza from Domino's, right? And you get like a four stage thing, so it says, your order has been received, and then stage two, your order is being prepared, order three, blah, 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 right? Same thing, same deal. If we can get across to people how we plan on doing this, it's all well and good promising, yeah, we're getting rid of tuition fees. Fucking tell them how you're gonna do it, and then they'll probably believe you a little bit more, right? As soon as we get in, we go, right, these are, this is our four step plan on how we're going to get rid of tuition fees. We're going to talk to the universities, we're going to tell them that, um, you know, oh, we're, going to we're going to reduce the cost yearly by about two grand every, I don't know, six months or whatever. I, I, I'm not an economist, I don't know how the hell we're going to do that. But get someone who does know and get them on the BBC and having a, you know, start a fight with Andrew Neil or something, go for it. But we need to be, we need to be the kind of people that the youth vote can respect and we need to keep them engaged for as long as we can when it comes up to a general election because these people are gonna be who knock on the doors in the rain, in a, on a windy autumn Wednesday <laughs> where you know nobody else wants to be on that door but you know they're the, you know, they're the, they're the energy and they're the fighting force behind this movement and to, to get the Oh Christ, how many people are in the late? So 70,000 people, is it something in your labor under the age of 27? So we've got to keep... 90,000. 90,000, thank you, Max. <laughs> Always get, ah, oh, dyslexic mess, man. So like, <laughs> 90,000 people within the Labour Party are under the age of 27. And those are the people that, that who I've seen on the doors who are the most involved, who, have, who, get, who care the most about being on the doors and being in phone banks and making sure that people are listening to us you know, they're the ones who come to things like this, and for us to get in, for us to get into power, and just be like, we've done it, and we, we just can't, we can't stay complacent. That's what I'm trying to get at. I, this is really long-winded, and I'm not making sense, but just bear, bear with me. 
So we've got like, you know the education system? I don't know, how many here have um, seen the, um, the Guardian thing that I did a while back? It's kind of, I had a lot of things on my mind that I wanted to say that I couldn't get out. One of those is that um, 51 million is planning on, is getting cut from the school's budget in Greater Manchester by 2021. 10,000 teachers have left the profession from 2010 to 2015. Um, 60% of schools' costings are rising faster than their income. We need to, we just need to sort that out. Um, I don't know, <laughs> it's literally, it's, it's that easy as keeping people um, from, from having mental breakdowns and, and making sure we can empower people to learn over pressurizing them and hitting them over the head with, if you don't do well in your school, you're gonna be sat on your ass watching Jeremy Kyle. We can't, you know, we can't, um, Ah, I'm not making any sense. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't get over the idea that we put, we bring so many people into this movement and we put, inspire so much hope and so much power and empowerment in these people that they can change things and they can make a difference and then we turn our backs on them and say, well actually, Google don't want to pay their taxes, and we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to make Google pay their taxes because Google might go elsewhere, you know. Or Brexit, you know. Now we've got Brexit, and you know there are actually twelve Jaffa cakes in a pack instead of ten. Uh, sorry, ten Jaffa cakes in a pack instead of ten, the twelve. And uh, actually, we're we're kind of we're kind of on the brink, and we we just have, fuck man, we like, just <laughs> sort it out. <laughs> Selena, you're going to offer a bit of historical context, I believe, as a historian about the deep state, about power, about the <coughs> difficulties of governing from the left. Yes, um, I'll try a little bit of that. Within, within the movement, the Labour movement, I think we've got um, two traditions, one that's a warning and one that's a real beacon of hope. So to start with the warnings first, the Labour Party has before, in government and opposition, gone to the brink with something really hopeful and, and so has the wider labour movement and I just want to give three examples really briefly here that may well be familiar to many people in the room so I will be very brief. First the general strike of 1926, um, something that we don't hear very much about but it was, it was a massive defeat for the labour movement. Basically the, the TUC um, uh, came out on strike, some unions came out on strike with TUC endorsement um, in favour of the miners who were trying to protect their right to collective bargaining, essentially. Um, and there was a nine-day strike in May 1926. And it brought out millions of workers, including many who the TUC had originally not wanted to come out on strike. Um, so as per usual, the grassroots were more radical in many ways than the leadership. Um, and people came out in their masses a huge proportion of the workforce, to the extent that the Tory government brought out the army, um, Churchill uh, was, was apoplectic and wanted us to bring out the tanks um, against the strikers. Um, and after nine days, the TUC and the Labour Party collapsed in the face of this. And many ordinary workers were really disappointed. They felt that there was an alternative, that if we had just stayed out a bit longer, we could have won, and instead it was a massive defeat. Okay, so that, that's one, and, and with each of these examples, what I'm trying to suggest is, it was never inevitable. It's never ever inevitable that we back down in the face of, in that case, the military and a Tory government. In the next case, in the face of international finance, which was in 1976. So in 1974, Harold Wilson's Labour Party is elected on possibly the most radical Labour manifesto that we've seen before this year, um, uh, comes into government and within a very short space of time, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, decides to use the international oil crisis really as an excuse, this is my interpretation, um, it, drawn on from many people, including Tony Benn, who was in government at that time, um, as an excuse to demand that the, the government back down on its socialist principles, and particularly on its public spending principles. And the cabinet had an incredibly divisive meeting, a meeting the legacy of which was still dividing the Labour Party and informing many of those debates that went on in the 1980s. And in the end, the right won. The right said, we will have to do what the IMF say. But there were many in the unions 
and even in the cabinet at the highest echelons of government who really knew what they were doing, who had been ministers before, like Ben, who had been a cabinet minister in the 60s, who said, we do not have to back down. There are alternatives here. We can communicate to the public what we want to do. We can try and stand firm. Um, there are other places that we can go. There are other alternatives. And really, their line was the same as Paul's. It was essentially, <coughs> let's not panic. Let's not do anything in a rush. Let's take our time to consult, to democratically consult with our movement, to work out from our collective expertise what we can do as an alternative. That didn't happen. It was a, a big defeat, and in many ways, helped to pave the way uh, for Thatcherism by giving ammunition to that great Tory lie that common sense um, is capitalism, that the two are absolutely interchangeable, there is no alternative. The third, perhaps even more shameful example, comes in 1984-85, where we now know that what Arthur Scardlin, the NUN, was saying was absolutely true, that Thatcher had been planning this for years, the confrontation with the miners, that it was entirely political. And the Labour Party locally showed great solidarity, as did many of the unions, but nationally, the leadership was a real letdown. Um, and again, backed away from massive class confrontation, in that case because they believed that it would make Labour look unelectable. What a mistake that was. So those are some real lessons about what happens if you act in haste or on ill-judged assumptions that are made without consultation about what is economically viable or what makes you electable, and which in each case is never proven. You know, if we think about the IMF case in 1976, the actual consequences of what happened there were disastrous. We're constantly told by the press and so on that that cabinet made the only possible decision um, because the alternative would have been a disaster. Well, I'm sorry, but given that economic inequality then rose hugely over the subsequent 20, 30 years, given the state that the country is now in, that Paul outlined for us so eloquently, I think that that, disaster, that, 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 that decision in 1976 was economically disastrous. So these are all decisions that were taken in haste without due thought and process, and, and we need to learn from that. But we do have examples of really good practice as well, and many of us who were at the events earlier in this building upstairs were reminded of them. They come out largely of the trade union movement, which is a longer run part of our movement than the Labour Party, which only came to being in the 20th century. But the TUC, the trade union movement, was founded here in the first half of the 19th century. And we can really learn from that because, and I won't go on about examples, and I know some comrades in the room were upstairs and others have been massively involved with the recent campaign by the McDonald's workers. And we've seen some really notable victories and encouraging signs within the labor movement generally nationally and internationally um, over the last few years. And I think what those victories show, as with the movement in the 19th century, is that anything is possible. Because they told us back in the 19th century that we couldn't unionize. We, we, we weren't articulate enough, we didn't have an education, many of us weren't literate, and yet people got together and organized, and by the end of the 19th century had collective bargaining rights. None of those employers wanted to give collective bargaining rights. They had no interest in negotiating with people. Many of them were using unskilled workers who they said could easily be replaced. And if any of the workers made, made any threats, then they would be out on their ear. And yet we did it because actually we stood firm, united, and more and more people joined. Not just because they thought, oh, well, they're getting something, so I'll join them. But because, as has been intimated here, and as Jeremy Corbyn intimated in his speech at conference, People, yes, they do think about bread and butter issues, but they also want better for their kids. And so they, all, they have got always the capacity to be imaginative, to be political, to think ahead. And the trade union movement makes sense. Whereas employers, in the end, very often just looking to make a fast buck, they don't have their own future. So their interests are always disconnected to ours in the end. And we've seen in recent years as well that that kind of, the older labor common sense of, you can't unionize unskilled workers. You can't easily unionize workers who were born outside the UK. You can't. It's all been shown to be a lie. You can union, I saw someone speak from the International Trade Union Movement, ITUC, recently. And um, it was quite entertaining because there were some big multinationals at the table and they said to her, where can't you unionize? And she sat back and she folded her arms and she smiled at them and she said, 
we can unionise anywhere the hell we want where there are workers who you haven't got insurance. <laughs> collective power, we would not be sat here now saying this is the home of the TUC, because there was no feasible reason for that to succeed. That's the history. How do we learn from that in terms of, um, of, the, next, of the next government? They've got, to hit, they've got to hit the ground running, and that means having strong policies. The manifesto was a start, but I absolutely welcome the NEC's decision on the Commission on Labour Party Democracy, because we need full consultation to make sure we've got strong, robust policies in all areas. They're not there yet. We need that, and we need a 100-day program. Now, that consultation, we need to make sure is totally democratic. From the top, the Labour Party is doing absolutely the right thing with that commission. Organisations like Momentum, we've got to do our part as well. At the moment, there are various people who Labour talk to. John McDonnell is an absolute star because he searches far and wide for experts. But those of us who are in connection with shadow ministers know that they are still under threat from the right of our party. They don't have all the time in the world. So those of us who've got their ear have got to make sure that other experts, other experienced comrades who can, who can lend support, get to those channels. Yeah, so we don't get back to that dreadful situation that I used to cringe at where the people who were close to Tony Bear were always sort of saying to him, oh, Tony said, Alistair told me. You know, Gordon says, I mean, it's just awful, isn't it? And actually, one of the things I like about having meetings with shadow ministers now is that when they talk about Jeremy Corbyn, they talk about Jeremy Corbyn. They don't expect me to call him Jeremy or anything like this. You know, it's, they're, they're trying to be very democratic. So those of us who are lucky enough to have some kind of ear with them, we need to make sure we spread the love, we get the word out, we get other people in. We also need to make sure, though, that we've got good outriders, which is a term that I've nicked from Owen Jones's The Establishment. Excellent chapter in there about how the right have got outriders, including liberal ones like Polly Twinebee. We need to make sure that those of us who've got a voice in the press, in the media, use it as much as we can, but that also all of us who've got a social media presence use that to get the word out that common sense is about socialism. We also need to make sure that within the local party and, within, and, and regionally as well, that we've got the grassroots with us, and we have. And that is something which is so new. Because all of those examples that I talked about in the past, even in 76, where the cabinet was split, the, the top echelons, the leader of the party, was, was of the right, essentially. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of us. So we've got this amazing opportunity now, which is very, very new, which is right at the top of the party, the left is represented. And we've also seen that at the top of many of our trade unions as well. So that is something we can really, really build on. And we've got that with the grassroots um, as well. So we need to make sure, though, that that is reflected in terms of how our local parties operate. And those of us who are within the Labour Party know that Labour Party politics is not fun. It's really boring um, a lot of the time. So I know we've been talking in our local party about the need to bring new members in and members who aren't as active in. <coughs> fun stuff, stuff like this. Days where people can bring kids. Those kinds of events that bring people in, that make them go into branch meetings a bit less purgatory than they can be. We've got to do that because the councils will be really, really important. A lot of Labour's policies, if you look at, say, education, are about devolving to local areas. So these right-wing Labour councils potentially have a lot of power, but we've got leverage over them. We know we have, because we're already seeing it. Even in Manchester, where the, the right-wing council is very, very powerful. So we need to make sure that we keep the pressure on. Yes, branch meetings are dry, but if we can just make sure that these councillors and these MPs know that their careers depend on us, then we've got a bit of leverage. And I stress that here because I know that I'm among friends, and I also have seen how the right have operated since the election with their, well, we've changed a bit, and you know, and all of this, and we just want a broad church, and you know, we just, you know, want to represent all of you. I'm sorry to sound factional, but they are talking crap. <laughs> Because we know that they are still selecting their friends when, when positions come up within the Labour Party, when there are positions for councillor, with the MPs. We know that they are still resisting what is going on at national level within the PLP. 
So we have to be really, really cautious when, when they try and call us out and sort of suggest that we're being factional or, you know, we, we are somehow being hostile to them and say, yeah, we are. That's exactly what we're doing, actually. You know, you, you know, you're with us or you're against us. And historically, like in 1976 with the IMF, sometimes our worst enemies have been the ones who are closest to us. So we need to be very, very careful with the right and the Labour Party. Just to end on, how do we take on the multinationals? You know, I know that always seems like such a, a huge thing, you know, these, these huge global corporations. And as Paul's intimated, that's why there's got to be really well thought out socialist policy at the top of the party before we even get into government. And there is from people like McDonnell. But let's also remember, many multinationals operate locally. They operate, as some of us have heard this afternoon from Unison, um, as social care providers. <coughs> they operate as sponsors of academy chains in our schools. Those are only two examples. Those are places where we can get them. Some of the trade unions are, orga are already organising around that. We can organise against things like academy schools. And we can look for the links between those who try to take apart a Labour government and those local providers on the ground. And we can go for them as long as we've already worked out local campaigns for unionising and organising in those workplaces and against things like the academisation of our schools. So those local campaigns can really come into their own, I think. We need to use social media and we need international networks as well because that will help, you know, to be able to have the, inter the international trade union movement on our side. But in the end, I haven't got any specifics on how we do what Paul said, and as he intimated, we need the expertise of comrades in the room to start thinking about this. What we do if we find that the banks and the multinationals and the Bransons and all the rest of them take it on, we know that Corbyn and McDonnell and Trickett and the rest of them are gonna stand up and say, bring it on. And that is massive. And we need to, at the very least, be solid with them. Because as I've tried to say, socialists, got nowhere without taking a leap of faith because everything that we've done has been about bread and butter issues but very often we've had no precedent for what we've done we've just had to look at the future and say we think we can do better with our imagination with our potential and we're just going to take a leap and see what happens and in the end when that exit poll comes out saying Labour has won by a fucking landslide, <laughs> we are going to drink ourselves to death and then we are going to get up at six o'clock the next morning and link arms and we're going to take that leap of faith. Any difficulties you endure in the coming months and years, just remember that moment, that exit poll. <laughs> remember or, you know, speculate about Dimbleby's face, about Jeremy Corbyn in the car, the jag on the way to Buckingham Palace. <coughs> Next is um, Max. Max be talking about us. Max, obviously we had a brief discussion prior to the talk, what would you like to speak upon, etc. Max just said, the party. Uh, <laughs> So with that in mind, I'll leave it to Max. <clears throat> so Labour in power. What does Labour in power mean? Well, for la Labour in power for me means a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in favour of working people and their families. That's what I was always brought up to believe the Labour Party stood for, and that's what we've got to do. Um, when I said to Aaron I wanted to talk about the party, the reason I want to talk about the party is because the party is our vehicle fundamental social change. And as it's presently structured, as we all see over the course of the past few years with the domination on high from the start <coughs> side and so on, is that what <coughs> they are very keen to do is to control us. And the reason they're keen to control us isn't because they're all nasty controlling individuals and whatnot, it's structural. It's because all political parties reflect the type of society in which they come from. And we live in a capitalist society, and so the Labour Party and its structures, practices, and modes of behaviour reflects capitalist logic and capitalist order. That's why the Labour Party is an extremely top-down body. It's just like capitalism. You have a few people at the top, a small minority, who tell the masses what they are allowed and what they aren't allowed to do, and we're all supposed to go along with it. Now, if you are in favour of a 
social society like I am, and I assume the majority of people in this room are. Anybody who isn't? <laughs> um, I'm kidding. You know. <laughs> what that means is that if we are to transform society, then the first step is to transform the party. Democratise the party, to democratise the state, to democratise the economy, because unless you democratise the state, you'll never be able to democratise the economy, and if you don't democratise the economy, then you'll never have socialism. So, otherwise you just have a sort of uh, more nicer version of capitalism, and I don't know about you, but I don't really fancy being exploited for the rest of my life. Um, I don't even really want to work, either. <laughs> That's why I'm really pro the post-work society. Right? You know, I want to lounge about in bed all day watching Rick and Morty on Netflix, and, uh, chatting to me mates, and you know, that's what life should all be about. Um, but uh, but anyway, I digress. More to the point. As we're presently structured, we are geared towards a specific type of politics, the politics of electoralism, that it's all about getting the vote out and that nothing else matters. But the fact remains that we can't afford to do that anymore because there are millions of people out there who need our help. Now, we can't wait until election time. And even when we, it, and even when we win the election, which I'm sure we will win the next election, or at least I hope so, uh, it won't be enough simply to elect 300 odd Labour MPs, give them a pat on the back and go, go on lads, it's your turn now. Because they will face pressures from all sides and uh, even from inside. Now this is why we then go back to the, the, the question of the party, because the limits of party democracy itself reflect the limits of capitalist democracy. We've had this big awful debate around uh, the issue of mandatory reselection as a but nobody's really tried to explain what it actually means. Well, all that mandatory reselection means is that within the lifetime of each parliament, the constituency Labour party would get together and decide who they were going to run at the next election. Now, what that allows you to do is to make your uh, prospective candidate, if they were the former, if they were the existing member of parliament for your constituency, accountable for the actions uh, and the things that they do in the name of Labour. Um, so it's not as frightening as it sounds, but the reason why it's so frightening to the press barons and backbench MPs is because it, it challenges the logic of capitalist democracy. That a representative is supposed to be up there and once they're there they do all wonderful things and they're so nice and lovely. It goes back to the ideas of Edmund Burke in the 17th century. You know, this was a man who is now famed and uh, famed for his contributions to the thought of parliamentary democracy, but he only visited his constituency three times in 20 odd years. Um, you know, hardly the type of person we want our representatives to be basing themselves on, but in far too many cases, that is what we've got. And so this then brings us to the task of local parties in government. And in national government, that means how do we organise the unorganised? It's not enough to just simply sign them up to register to vote, because as we've said, that's, that isn't enough, because we need to help our people now. And that means organising, organising the unorganised, and organising them in such a way as to empower them, to liberate them in themselves, to give them the tools they need to understand the world around them, uh, and to change things. Now, there's a, a wonderful comrade just over there in a pair of glasses hiding at the back named Tom Blackburn. Now, Tom Blackburn is one of, all I would say, the best of the new generation of party theorists that is coming up uh, inside the party now. And he's written an excellent piece called Corbynism from Below, which basically says, we're not gonna wait to be in government to start helping our people. We're going to start organising them. We're going to create tenant unions to go up against road landlords. We're going to operate food banks so that our people get the food that they need to survive. We're going to run, uh, you know, childcare services, Sunday schools, all that lot, just to Im to improve people's lives in the here and now, and to give them something to aspire for. Look at all the things we've been able to do outside of power 
give us the keys and uh, we'll change the world. Um, the task ahead and the road ahead is going to be a long and bumpy one. There will be times when we will, as a party membership, be angry with our leaders. You know, this is why I supported Jeremy right from the off. Within an hour of him announcing, I was going around telling people that we were going to win. They all laughed, <laughs> but somebody had to. But, you know, he's not God. Him and Jeremy, Jeremy and John are not gods. They're not going to be able to change the world on their own. They're not going to be able to democratise the state on their own by being nice to the civil service who will oppose pretty much every measure we do because they're a bunch of neoliberals <coughs> now. They will need us to provide pressure from below so as that they can then provide pressure on top and do what I like to call a pincer strategy. You pincer the state in the middle. It has no option. You squeak as... Dennis Healy said, you squeeze them till their pips squeak. <laughs> that is the only way we're going to win. And we have to prepare ourselves for that. Because if we don't, well, who knows if we'll win at all. 